Welcome back to another episode of the Industrial Real Estate Show. I'm super excited for this week's episode as I'm joined by Jay Olshansky, who's the president and CEO of NAI Global. He has well over 40 years of commercial real estate experience, and he's got access and exposure to many different markets all over the world. So he brings a great perspective to the market, combining his experience and his role. I've interviewed him a few times in the past. He's always one of my favorite guests to talk to, and this episode episode is no different. We tried a little bit of a different format in this week's episode. So it starts off with just me in there, but you'll see him come on after. And he's the highlight of this episode as all my guests always are. And uh, one thing we did different with this is we change this up where we I normally ask the questions and then the guest responds and that goes throughout the show uh, since we've started our private network uh, we are now having the members ask questions at the end so all that I've included in this podcast episode is just the questions that I prepared for Jay and uh, so it's a bit of a shorter interview but it's action-packed uh, and a ton of value in here so I think you're going to really enjoy this episode uh, thanks for watching let me know what you think of it in the comments below first I, I guess what I'd really like to explore and we've got a lot of people on here and I think there's gonna be some other questions that come in as well for you but what I'd really like to explore is the last four years being very tumultuous volatile unpredictable and now we're into another year in 2024 where it looks equally as unpredictable still going to have interest rate pressure u.s election coming up which is certainly going to add to the volatility how would you summarize the last four years in the context of the 40 plus years you've had in this business Wow. Well, that's a big question, but let's, so let's start. Um, certainly, um, in all of our lifetimes, we've never seen, if we go back four years, we've never seen a pandemic um, that hit the world, not just the United States or Canada, uh, where we had at risk uh, loss of life, shutdowns of businesses, completely changing the way. But certainly, you know, if you, I mean, you, you got to go way back to probably like World War II, maybe Vietnam to get to anything that was as disruptive as COVID was. And even then, um, COVID certainly, uh, because mainly due to loss of life, completely changed about how everybody viewed everything. Now, the, the saving grace to COVID, one, it wasn't that long, you know, it, that, but it doesn't help anyone if they had a family member or a friend that passed from it. So I, I don't want to diminish the fact that COVID had some devastating health effects for families and for people, et cetera. But it really wasn't that long as it could have been. And but what in and, and the other thing that happened is thank God that we it happened at a time where mobile technology and high speed internet was pretty robust, if not extremely robust. You know, I had a long conversation with someone recently in, in the commercial real estate business about could you imagine if COVID hit 15 years ago? You know, when there was no iPhones, there was no high speed Internet in lots of places. You know, we weren't running our whole lives, including our commercial real estate business on our phones or on our computers. Um, you know, everyone would have had to go to work. You know, that would have been something and it could have actually been much worse. So so COVID totally disrupted our world as we know it. And, you know, and certainly the commercial real estate business got completely disrupted from that. Now, the biggest loser in commercial real estate coming out of COVID was obviously office space, you know, because as I like to say, you know, if you work at UPS or if you work at Federal Express or you work at McDonald's or you work at, you know, unless you're, unless um, the McDonald's closed for a short period of time, you had to go to work. So, so basically, people affected by COVID and staying at home was only 30 to 40% of the population. It wasn't, you know, 
the doctors had to go to work, the hospitals had to go to work, the UPS driver had to go to work, the mailman, you know, all those sort of things had to go to work. So it really is a small segment. And we also saw things like industrial explode, you know, during COVID because just in time delivery, warehousing, you know, everyone was, I mean, I wasn't going to the drugstore, so my toothpaste had to be delivered. You know, so everything had to be delivered. So all the logistics, all the Amazon effect just got accelerated, you know, from the online shopping, et cetera. And then, you know, all of a sudden it's much better. And then people are going back to work in their everyday jobs that they have to. They never really stayed home. And even people were venturing out, you know, obviously the health risks weren't as bad, but it, you know, if you think about hospitality or hotels, which is commercial real estate, as a lot of you might rem- we were canceling events. We weren't the only people canceling events. Everybody was canceling events. So some hotels have not made it back since COVID, by example. So the pandemic and COVID had such a, a different effect on where you sit. You know, you know, if you if we want to pull the politics into it you know, a little bit, you know, Florida probably did a little bit better than, let's say, New York City during the hot, you know, from that point of view, because they stayed open uh, more. Uh, certainly there was migration out of San Francisco, Chicago, New York uh, to southern areas. I would imagine there was probably some migration even out of Canada to southern areas just because, you know, if you didn't need to be in your office, you could migrate and work from your vacation house or you know, I I or I know a lot of Canadians go south in the US that you could work from Arizona, you could work from Florida, you could work for different areas, you know, up from that point of view. So there were some things that happened that from that point of view. Um and then as we're coming out of it, we had some of the best commercial real estate years ever, you know, coming out of it, the the first two coming out of it. And then all of a sudden interest rates and inflation on uh, not just in the US and that's what everyone forgets. I mean, yes, our Federal Reserve raised interest rates pretty drastically, but that was happening in Europe. That was happening I and I don't follow Canadian interest rates as much, but I'm assuming you had some of that. And we were getting inflation, so they had to, you know, get that under control for various reasons. And then all of a sudden there's a disconnect between what the seller thought they could sell a piece of property for and what the buyer could buy it and finance it for. And that I think has been the last 15 months. And I think that will continue into 2024. So all of a sudden activity levels went to the floor in 2023 where if you wanted to sell even your industrial building, unless it was mission critical, you know, you weren't going to get a three cap on it because you had to borrow at five or seven or more. And then all of a sudden people decided, all right, well, I'm not going to go back to the office two days a week or three days a week or five days a week. So all the CFOs and all the head of real estates at all the corporations, big and small, woke up and said, well, wait a second. My lease is coming up and nobody's coming into the office. We're still making money and they're working at home. So, you know, maybe I'll mandate they have to come back, but maybe I'll take 50% less space because I really don't need space. And so all of a sudden, all the B buildings and all the C buildings and office space, and this is everywhere, basically, we're like, well, you know, I'm not going to pay rent on space that nobody's coming to. And then if you had a lease and you had too much space, you were going to basically try to sublet it if you had way too much space because people weren't coming back to the office. You didn't need to do that. And then all of a sudden you realized, well, hold on. Not only aren't they coming back to the office, but even if they all came back to the office, I've got too much space because I don't have as many jobs as I used to have. So now we've got, you know, whether it's Washington, D.C., New York City, 
and and you guys can fill me in on Montreal and Toronto and places in Vancouver and places like that. But Chicago, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Los Angeles suburbs, Dallas, Houston, Atlanta, that have the highest vacancy rates in office space ever. Forget in recent times, ever. They, you know, New York City has got the highest vacancy rate in office space ever. Washington, D.C., ever. San Francisco, they've had high vacancy rates before. So we have this enormous problem that, okay, what are we going to do? So all of a sudden, if you needed space, you had a flight to quality. So all of the tenants that their leases were coming up or their leases or they needed space, they were moving into the A buildings. There was for three reasons. One, well, if I have to have space, I want to have the nicest space to get my employees to come back. That was number one reason. I want a good place for my employees. Number two, well, if I'm taking 50% less space, and I'll use a New York City example, and I'm paying $70 a square foot in my BC crappy building, and I can pay $150 a foot in the brand new property built right on Grand Central Station, I'm going to do that because at the end of the day, the rent in dollars and total annual dollars is less. So we've seen this thing happen. And and then at the same time, and I know I'm I'm, I'm going on and I'll stop. But you asked a big question. <laughs> I, and I love the answer. So please yeah, keep going. It, 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 at the same time, interest rates went from basically zero to 5% in a very short period of time. Now, I'm older than a lot of people on the call. I don't consider 5% interest rates that high. I understand when you go from two to five, it's really a drastic change. And now all of a sudden you've got an empty building with no tenants. And if you were on any sort of floating loan, you just had like, in some cases, 500 to 700 basis points increase in your interest rate, or if you needed to refinance, and the math doesn't make sense. So now you've got the lender saying, oh, shit, excuse my French, um, you know, what are we going to do? So they basically for the last year and a half said, well, we'll just blend and extend and hope the owner will correct and well, they're going to stop pretending and extending now. And you're starting to see property sell office 20 cents on the dollar from the last sale, 30 cents on the dollar for the last sale. And it could be less. In some cases, I heard of a deal in Southern California, an office owner took the building to market. It's It has one tenant in it with three years left. It has some cash flow. They got no bids for anyone to buy it. So we're in this disconnect. Well, well, if you get no bids, there's not a disconnect. If you get one bid, you can elect to not do it. So we're in this terrible time right now, you know, of what what's going to happen. And yes, you do hear about some good things happening, you know, but in general, it's not enough volume to solve and uh, and um and Chad, is this a group mainly of brokers on the call? It's a it's a mix. There be brokers okay, so, and yeah. So to the brokers on the call, in a certain regard, there's not enough volume like there used to be. So if you're an industrial broker, you might have more volume than the office broker, but even the industrial broker is not having as much volume as they used to have. And if you're you know, if you're a land broker, well, when you have higher interest rates, maybe if you got some good home builders to sell to, you're doing okay. But everything is just down. So anytime the brokerage business goes flat or goes down in volume, that's terrible for the brokers and the brokerage business because essentially, if there's no activity, um, there's no commissions. From the owner's point of view, it really depends on what type of property you have and what your hold period is. So to the owners on the prop on the call, it really is a question of, you know, do you need to sell? Did you did your interest rate go up? Did you need to are you underwater? You know, so it really is individual property by property, location by location, you know, and depending on what it is. If you got an empty hotel that used to just be a convention hotel, 
you know, maybe it'll come back. Maybe. I mean, if it's in Orlando, I think you'd be okay. You know, you know, but you know, there, the, I'll give you a, a, a drastic example. The Four Seasons Hotel in, in downtown, right here in Manhattan, five-star hotel has not opened since uh, COVID. Has not. And other hotels have sold at 20 and 30 and 40 cents on the dollar from the last sale in Manhattan. Now, that's the bad news. The good news is the occupancy levels are way up in New York because there are more tourists and things like that. I saw one question come across, which I get all the time. Well, why can't we take all these office buildings and convert them into residential or knock them down and make, you know, if they're suburban office buildings, knock them down and make them industrial buildings, which is, you know, or something like that or a hotel or, so, or different things. So I, I'll start with the fundamental answer to that. You can in maybe 1% of the overall stock case. You can't do it. You can't take the suburban office building that is in a, you know, a non-industrial area and knock it down and convert it into, you know, a uh, 240,000 square foot uh, 36 foot clear Amazon perfect building because, you know, what are you going to do with all the trucks? What are you going to do with all the zoning? What are you going to do with all of that? And then the, the other aspect is some of those people don't want an industrial building like that in an area that was zoned for office, by example. Now, there could be a case where you have an empty parking lot at a mall that's been shuttered where that makes perfectly logical sense but it's not that simple and if you take everyone says well oh, let's just take all the empty office buildings everywhere and convert them into residential okay that's fine maybe you can do that but you know i'll give you an example most of the b buildings and c buildings in new york city that are vacant i, I live in new york city i don't want to live in those neighborhoods so even if they converted the building to a beautiful apartment building well, it's really not a residential type city space. It's not near the park. It's not near the water. It's not near the amenities. And then the other thing, and just think this very simply. If you have a 30,000 square foot floor and you have, let's say, a center core, how do you do a one bedroom apartment that's not a bowling alley? Just because of the window line from the core to the window line, most jurisdictions require at least one window for one bedroom, you know, to be. And, and so you have functional issues. Plus, most office buildings don't have the plumbing to do that. So it, it, it's easy to say, let's do this. But, you know, it's much harder to do it. And they don't even get me involved into cost or things like that. Now, another example that's happening in New York City. Cliff Moskowitz, who's our EVP, and myself met with somebody and they said, well, what do you think we should do with our empty office building? And, you know, we were advised that maybe we should knock it down and wait for the next cycle. So that's what people are thinking about, you know, in where we're, it's very drastic. So let me stop there, Chad, and then we can try to answer some other questions you did ask me a big question though i did and i and i love the answer so i'm glad yeah. that you elaborated on that there, there's a couple of questions that have come in but just sure. before we get to that uh, because I, there's some great questions in here i think people especially in the industrial sector underestimate the impact that a declining office market will have on the rest of the market. If for no other reason, then there's going to be a lot of lenders that get stung by the debt associated with the office market. And that could make them have less money to actually allocate to other, other opportunities. Do you see a noticeable impact or correlation that the office market will have on the market as a whole? Or do you think that there's a silo around that, that office could struggle. There could be owners that look to knock buildings down or try to retrofit. Do you see some creep from that office sector getting into other areas of commercial real estate? I haven't really seen it or have had people tell me about, well, you know, I had trouble with my industrial building because that owner's too over allocated and, you know, first are in our the lenders over allocated in other bad areas. Now, Obviously, you could have trouble if somebody is, you know, in dire financial straits from one area to another. But, you know, it, again, it's very much individualized, you know, from that point of view. 
in general, and Chad, you know this, I mean, we've got a very strong industrial group throughout North America. And, you know, they're basically saying we were here, but we're just here. So the overall activity, the overall leasing, the overall, the sales are still happening. Industrial is still a wonderful product type because you could also argue there's not enough of it still in certain areas. And then, you know, you definitely have um, the aspect of, yes, even though Amazon has, let's say, not taken or bought as much space as they have in the past, this actually created opportunities for others to fill some of those spaces that they were getting boxed out. And I'm talking about all over the place. I'm not talking about one market versus another. It's still the darling of, you know, of I would say of all the food groups and commercial real estate right now, you know, I would, I, if I had to put it on, a, I would say industrials first and then <laughs> retail has come back completely in general too, from pre, you know, back to your question four years ago, it's completely back, you know, in some cases moving ahead. Um, but with the other thing that this all proves is that I'm sure all of you probably four years ago, five years ago, we don't need another shopping center or another mall ever, you know, that you get. So all these things, you know, cycle and office space will cycle too. I mean, I can remember in 1990, and that's a long time ago now, that was the SNL crisis in, in, the, in this area. Um, and certainly they said, we don't need another office building ever you know, because there was a huge glut of office space and same problem. And by 1995, they were building more buildings than you ever know what to do with because it is it thing, there were job, job creation happen. Uh, so I think industrial is still going to be the darling. Um, I still think, you know, you could get pockets that get maybe overbuilt, you know, certain pockets in the U.S., you know, like the I-55 corridor has got a lot of, you know, buildings being built. Um, but, you know, anything close to metropolitan areas, they're still servicing, um, you know, the just in time delivery. I mean, I, I go home to my apartment building every night and I feel badly for my doorman and the super because the amount of packages that they have to deal with on a daily basis uh, is just still immense. So I think that continues. Um, I think it's just tempered a little bit, the returns. The interest rates are having an effect there. I mean, you're not going to buy a 3% Amazon lease property when you have to borrow at six, you know, that's, I, so, so there's going to be some settling of that. I, I honestly don't understand the net lease business right now. And that's slow, you know, like, I, I mean, I'm not a, I, I don't eat Chick-fil-A by example, a lot of it, I've had it before, but I'd say every day I see a net lease coming across my computer saying, well, you can buy Chick-fil-A at 4%. And I'm thinking like, well, I can get 5% at Fidelity and get it out in five days cash. So why am I going to, you know, what's the upside? So so I think that's back to my point that there's a disconnect. So I don't think industrial will be hurt by the office paint. Great answer on that. Uh, I will get to the other questions that came in, but uh, Stephen asked one that was related to the a comment that you made. Uh, certain areas still don't have enough industrial. Do you have any idea in mind of what those areas might be that are perhaps uh, underbuilt? Well, you know, certainly um, all the close-in areas in the U.S. to metropolitan cities, like New York close-in doesn't have enough industrial space, but there are physical limitations on that. That's really the issue. Uh, you know, even Los Angeles, and you see this, it, I, I think that it really depends on the, the shifting of the migration. So in a certain regard, you know, everyone would love to have their warehouse, their 36 foot clear, their 40 clear, you know, close to New York City, but there's not enough land available to them. Um, and I would say that's true of Boston. That's true. Of, you know, so you're just going to see it, it. It just spreads out from that point of view. Um, it's just going to be nest. It'll be further away, but there's land available as you move further away to do industrial and in most metropolitan areas in the suburban areas, especially along the, the, the interstate corridors have plenty of land and there's good construction going on and there's good absorption. So I, I 
and because the vacancy rates are still relatively low. I think if you know, and we're and certainly the overbuilding that you might see, like we've seen in past cycles, won't happen because the lenders and even the developers are a little bit more conservative about you know buying a piece of land and putting up a building, even an industrial building, you know, that they don't want to get caught. And interest rates are higher, so it's a little bit more expensive than to, you know, put up an industrial building. Um, but I think the marketplace, you know, I mean, I'm still hearing about a lot of people buying land in, in anticipation to build industrial, just about everywhere, in the, certainly in the United States. You guys could probably speak more for Canada. You know, you, know, you got and you have markets, you know, like Reno that have just exploded, you know, or you have, like I said, the I-55 corridor kind of from Chicago down, you know, it's just exploded. Um, you know, even the you know, I, a lot of these different interstate corridors that you never thought would have, you know, there's parts of Georgia, you know, that have huge amount of industrial manufacturing due to the automotive business. Certainly port logistics and different things, whether it's Savannah, whether it's, you know, uh, you see a lot coming out of Savannah, you see a lot coming out of even the Texas intermodal, you know, like, I mean, the, the intermodal in Chicago, I think is like 70 miles outside of Chicago, where there's plenty of land to build things, because the close end stuff is still so I think you will see continuing of that. Yeah, agreed. And it's similar in Canada as well. Like we there's a couple markets that face similar problems as Los Angeles and New York and Vancouver, Toronto being the two obvious ones where there's just land constraints. You just there you can't get available land. So that starts pushing things more inland. So we'd we'd be in Edmonton, and there's a couple people in here on Edmonton, we'd be similar to Dallas, where we can theoretically grow in every single direction. So we face a similar similar challenge where like Dallas, you can add, and they have added, I think they added 70 million square feet worth of industrial space last year, because there is no physical restraints that, that those are the areas. And, and I think that you're seeing that in a market like Dallas, where they ha are seeing higher than average vacancy rates compared to those uh, coastal markets. So it, that will be very interesting to see.